We founded Rebuild only about a year ago. The idea was we were concerned about you know, sort of the degradation of the U.S. industrial base, which has been going on a long time. So uh, a number of us who had worked in manufacturing a long time got together. Our chairman is a gentleman named Jeff Wilkie, who's the number two guy at Amazon for many years. Oh, wow. I happened to go to graduate school with him in 1991. And um, a number of the rest of us that had been in that same sort of graduate program and had worked together over the years, uh, raised money to establish a business, not a fund or a private equity firm, but an actual company aimed at acquiring manufacturing businesses, improving their operations, and injecting a lot more engineering to enable them to be more competitive globally than is typically the case. You know, we went and looked at a lot of companies. We tried to meet smaller businesses, 20 million and down. And I happened to meet a guy named Jack Wilfley who ran a company called Orby in Denver. And we kind of hit it off and had a good, you know, kind of engagement there. And ultimately he decided and agreed to sell his business into Rebuild. And so that was the first business that we acquired. We really liked their thermoplastic production technology. So they have some innovative manufacturing equipment and processes that are in-house that are allowing them to take on markets that were traditionally the province of the import. So for example, we make uh, bicycle wheels in the US cheaper than you can import them from China. So that's kind of news to us and sort of gave us a sense that there's a real advantage there. And then from there we branched out. We uh, had met Steve Mead, who at the time was at Torre and ultimately came to work with us and he has a really good understanding of the lay of the land. And so we looked to then acquire uh, complementary businesses around that, right? So CDI, which does metals also, but you know, thermoplastics for aerospace, and then um, composite resources in the Carolinas, which is focused on thermal sets. So between those businesses, you have you know, a pretty wide dispersion of materials and process types, right? I'm sure we will add additional companies as we want to add other capabilities, but okay. we also aim to build out organically. Okay. So we are, you know, we built a commercial organization atop all of those companies, right? A lot of these smaller businesses don't have very sophisticated or scaled sales forces, for example. Yeah. So we were able to build that. And so the sort of interest we're getting from the market in new programs and, and production is very high. There's a lot of reshoring going on whether it's in sporting equipment or other things that people want to bring back to the States. So I think in the next two years, most of our investment will be in uh, establishing new plant. So we'll be building new plants to produce those products for people, all the way from industrial design, electronics, software, mechanical systems, and then plant automation. So we do all our own plant automation for these companies, for example. How do you see you're going to be able to move composites forward? So a lot of that is through process technology, so how to automate or improve the quality or the timeliness of the production processes behind these things, right? Mm -hmm. So take thermoset composites, their properties are pretty well established. They've been very high value, low volume production processes for a long time. We see some opportunities to change the way they're produced that would make them more cost effective and therefore accelerate the rate at which people could adopt them because we can drive the price down, right? Same with thermoplastic composites. We've developed production technologies and techniques that allow us to, as I gave the example of bicycle wheels, really change the price performance curve from what people are used to, and that, that drives adoption. So we can attack new applications or replacing metal parts, for example, with composites that wouldn't have been considered cost-effective previously. What works best for your problem? It might be a thermoset, it might be a special kind of thermoset, it might be a thermoplastic, it might be metals plus Etc. And we don't mind. So, you know, we already have across our businesses 200 engineers approximately. And so we're driving, you know, heavy engineering content with our customers. We want to work with them early to help design that product to be manufacturable. That's the other thing you see a lot of, right, is in composites, a lot of the houses are built to print houses. So they get a print and they make that print. We want to work with the customer before it became a print, optimize the design of it, so that it's made for a production process so that's effective. And we want to have a little bit more of a holistic view to that, because if you're going to make these things cost effective and broadly you know, entrench in the market, they have to be. A perfect example is we went from doing bicycle wheels to ATV wheels. So we developed a process to make wheels for ATVs. Okay. And so we can replace you know, uh, aluminum wheels on ATVs at a pretty competitive price point, and they have much less rolling inertia and sprung weight. So they just perform better. You get longer range if it's an electric vehicle. Right. They don't hit the curb and dent. They're really fantastic. But that all came from developing a process 
that made it cost effective. Obviously, everyone wants to make blades for every kind of drone in the world and all that, but more conventional industrial applications like just cooling fans or all these things, right, that are metal, you can replace a lot of those. And right, as these technologies and composites, materials, the design, the production become more mature, you're gonna see that cost basis coming down, right? And it'll be more omnipresent, right?